Now, I said I was going to give you a survey of dance injuries, and injuries implies musculoskeletal medicine. And when people hear, oh, you know, you take care of dancers, you take care of performers, you must be a super specialist. And although, as I showed you, the language is a little bit uh, special for dance and you need to know how to communicate with them, actually, to take care of performers, you need to be quite a generalist. Uh, hard to be a knee specialist and take care of dancers because they have problems really all over. And so let's look at some of their problems from head to toe. And this is going to be a survey. A lot of these topics will be covered in other modules of this course. Uh, and, uh, but, but let's get started. So let's start at the head. Uh, or the neck in this case, the cervical spine. Uh, as you can imagine, this kind of headdress might put your neck at risk. Uh, the costume, my grandmother would say, might give her a risk uh, for getting a cold, but that's another story. But these kind of large headdresses are certainly, certainly an occupational hazard in dancers. And dancers can get an acute strain uh, with spasm that really puts them out of commission completely. They can have a chronic strain with pain and tightness and overuse syndrome. And certainly they get cervical disc disease, like everybody does. They can get disc degeneration, which can manifest as a soft uh, herniation uh, or bony spurs, uh, like is more common in the cervical spine. And you have to take a step back a little bit and say, well, we're not really just talking about the cervical spine. We're talking about the whole upper quadrant, shoulders, glenohumeral joint, AC joint, or chromioclavicular joint, the scapular thoracic articulation. You have to consider all those when you take care of a dancer's neck. The upper thoracic spine is included, the first rib can be a particular problem, and the thoracic outlet needs to be included as well. So upper quadrant radicular symptoms can occur from cervical nerve compression. They can be intrascapular, they can go to, into the arm, forearm, and hand. You can have thoracic outlet type symptoms, which sometimes uh, affect the lower trunk, ulnar uh, C8 and T1, but sometimes other uh, trunks as well. And you can have myofascial pain syndromes. Now, what are some of the risk factors? Well, you can imagine that depending on how vigorous their choreography is or what their movement pattern is, that can be quite irritating. A company like this that does a piece like Paul Taylor's uh, Speaking in Tongues, a lot of frenetic movement, neck is being thrown around, more risk for cervical spine injury. A raked stage. Well, what is a raked stage? A stage that's raked is higher at the back than at the front and we're going to get into this more at a later lecture on musical theater. But a rake stage changes people's center of gravity and can affect their cervical spine. The headgear, like I showed you in the earlier slide, headdresses, wigs uh, can be heavy, can affect how they move their head. And sometimes in the musical theater world, a wireless microphone transmitter has to be worn under the wig. So what's the treatment? Not unexpectedly, it's rest and restricted activities, especially while they are acute. Medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxants, and even occasionally a short course of steroids for nerve pain can be very helpful. Uh, manual treatments, including stretching and modalities, are uh, needed. You have to look at their sleep positioning, especially in the younger performer. Uh, sleeping on stomach is not good for the cervical spine. And eventually the program has to work on strengthening and posture education to be able to keep them injury free. Let's move down a little bit and look at the thorax. Thorax problems in dancers can include rib injuries, of course. Rib fractures can occur. They can be traumatic or they can be stress. Uh, the costochondral junction, where the rib attaches to the cartilage, can get injured. You can have a sprain or you can have a frank disruption, a little bit less common, but sprains not uncommon. You can have a costovertebral injury where the rib articulates with the vertebra. So let's look at a couple of these. First, let's look at the anatomy. R costo means rib and chondral obviously refers to cartilage. So if you look at a particular rib here and we trace it around, it's brown on this uh, drawing, which is the bone, and then it turns to something, what, it's blue. Why is it blue? Well, that's the cartilage. This is flexible. This can move, the connection between the sternum and the rib. There are obviously also multiple muscles in between the ribs and powering some of the shoulder muscles that attach. So if you looked at the ribs, you can't see the cartilage. It's not visible on the x-ray. So you can trace out a rib, as I've done here with the fifth rib. You can trace it out all the way from the costovertebral joint all the way around, and eventually it just sort of ends and peters out. So to look for a rib fracture, we can only see it in this area. We can't see any damage to the cartilage. 
Now, the diagnosis of rib fractures is actually kind of hard because on plain radiographs, you're going to get a lot of false negatives. They don't show up for a while. After several weeks, you're going to find a healing callus. And I've certainly had dancers come in a month or two after an injury and complain that they had a problem with their ribs and it was really painful. And now it's okay, but they wonder what those lumps are. And those lumps on their ribs are the healing callus. In a professional performer who's in the midst of or about to start a, a show, you may need to determine are they able or unable to perform. And they want to know now. They don't want to wait two weeks until you get an x-ray and see a little healing. So the imaging method of choice is actually a bone scan or technetium syntogram. And we're going to go over in another talk uh, diagnostic imaging for uh, dancers. But just to show you a couple of bone scans or technetium syntograms on dancers, who had rib fractures. So here's on the left, you can see this is an anterior view, this is a front view, so you notice the ribs which show up on the bone scan, but the cartilage doesn't. The ribs sort of end here. Well, here is a dancer with a left second rib fracture just before the costochondral junction. And this a view from the back is another dancer, much more obvious, with two rib fractures in her posterior ribs. The costovertebral injuries are a little bit more complicated because the costovertebral joint is actually a very solid joint. So to talk about ribs going out is a little problematic, but ribs getting stuck um, possibly. But if we look at the, at the costovertebral joint, there, it's really a several articulations. One is that the rib articulates with both the vertebrae above and the vertebrae below. Um, so there's a fairly large joint. You can see the fibrous tissue that holds that rib in place. And then posteriorly, there's another articulation with this uh, process uh, off, uh, akin to a transverse process. And so that's holding the rib as well. Uh, so these ribs are pretty firmly held. Nevertheless, they can uh, get injured. Um, treatment, well, for fractures or sprains, it's really time, unfortunately. Uh, you have to have them rest until they're comfortable. You shouldn't strap their ribs because that can actually uh, predispose them to a pneumonia or some other lung problem. And then you have to mobilize them. I find that most dancers need some physical therapy, some exercises to mobilize after they've been splinting their ribs for the four weeks or so or six weeks that it takes them to heal. Now the costovertebral derangement or dysfunction, uh, I think you have to be a little bit more careful with these. They probably would benefit from an attempt of one or two mobilizations or manipulations. But if those fail, you probably should stop there. I have certainly seen some dancers end up with rib fractures or injuries from overzealous manipulation attempts. If we move down into the lumbar spine, we're going to start to get into some of the alignment issues that uh, affect dancers. In the lumbar spine, there are a couple of alignment abnormalities that you need to be aware of. One is the sway back uh, or hyperlordosis, the flat back or hypolordosis and a combination called tucking. We'll go into all three of these. If you look at choreography, some performers have to work with a sway back, as you can see here. So it is a hazard. Um, the sway back or lumbar hyperlordosis involves pelvic extension. There's a forward tilt of the pelvis and this increased curve in the back, as you can see here. This places the hips in a slightly flex position and provides better turnout because external rotation of the hip is actually increased with hip flexion. So the dancers like that. The flat back or lumbar hypolordosis, if, and if ex extreme, even a, a lumbar kyphosis, is a little less common but certainly is seen in some dancers who've lost all their curves. They have a flat back in their cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. And this is associated with a, a pelvic flexion or a backward tilt of the pelvis. So here's a schematic looking from the side of a lumbar spine where this blue circle is the acetabulum and in the center you see a neutral. On the right you see a sway back. So the pelvis is tilted forward, the lumbar spine increases in lordosis. And on the left a flat back, pelvis tilting backwards, flatter lumbar spine. Now tucking is kind of interesting because tucking is a more complex sequence of events and you're going to see this in dancers more often than you're going to see isolated uh, uh, hyperlordosis or hypolordosis. So, and you should try this on your own. You should all get up and go through some of these things because it's really just three steps that, that a dancer will use to tuck. Uh, they're going to let their back sway. They're going to go into a hyperlordotic posture and let their pelvis extend. And so they're going to look a little funny. They're going to look like that first picture. 
they are then going to turn out their feet and their hips fully to lock their pelvis on the ground. It locks their pelvis by the friction of the feet on the floor. Of course, it doesn't look so good. Their turnout may look nice, but they got a, their, their back is hyperlordotic. They got to sway back. And so then the, the tucking or the tucking under is trying to flatten the lumbar spine as much as possible. And if you do that, you'll see that you actually hold a huge amount of tension uh, in your pelvis, in your lower back, even in your thighs, hips, all the way down to the foot and ankle. And this can be a, quite a problem. And a lot of young dancers will do this tucking until they're corrected, or if, hopefully if they're corrected, sometime in their training. What can result? Well, acute spondylysis, or a stress a fatigue fracture of the spine, of what in the area called the pars intraarticularis, uh, is, uh, is something that can occur. This occurs usually in the lower lumbar area, and the risk factor is this hyperlordotic posture. It doesn't only occur in dancers, it occurs in gymnasts and football linemen. The symptoms or pain in the dancer with back bending or a port de bra back or with an arabesque where the pain would be on the same side as the pathology. So to diagnose it, you need to look at radiographs, but the first thing you need to diagnose an acute spondylysis is a normal radiograph. The oblique views, which show that pars uh, have to be normal, it hasn't cracked through already, that is, and we need to locate the neck of the Scotty dog. So here's the pars interarticularis, or here's the Scotty dog, you can see here's the ear, here's the nose, here's the front paw, the body, the back paw, and if you look across the neck here, that's really where the pars is represented on the oblique radiograph. So here's an, uh, an oblique radiograph on a dancer with a problem with her, her pars, and you can see several of the Scotty dogs here with a nice looking neck. You can actually even see the eye on this dog, dog perhaps, these two. Uh, this lower one, so this is L3, 4, and L5, L5 does not look so good. Here I have traced it out, and you can just barely see, perhaps, that there's a lucency across the neck. There's a fracture across the neck of the pars, so this actually isn't an acute spondylolysis. We would not want to see this to make the diagnosis. This is actually a chronic one. We'll get into that in a moment. But on the acute ones, what we expect to find is a normal x-ray, so we don't see that line, and we see on a bone scan a positive or hot scan where a SPECT or tomographic bone scan localizes to the PARS. An MRI may or may not show the abnormality depending on whether it is protocoled correctly. You really need to have continuous axial cuts and a high enough resolution scanner to look at the PARS. Most MRI scans are uh, aimed to look at the disc area. So if you suspect this when you order your MRI, make sure you tell the radiologist. So here's an acute spondylolysis as shown by a SPECT scan, so it's a cross-section of the, of, the, of the dancer, where this is the right side, this is the left side, we're looking up from below, this is the uh, lumbar vertebra, and there where the arrow is pointing is the increased uptake consistent with a stress fracture, acute stress fracture. If the patient is skeletally immature, so a young dancer, then this is an active process with good healing potential and you can immobilize them in a TSLO, a brace, a Boston overlap brace. It may take three months or so, but these will heal. In older dancers, unfortunately, it, it may not, and you may end up with what is called a chronic spondylolysis, which is on radiographs that gap that we saw earlier, and on a, if, you, if it's a bilateral spondylolysis, you may even see a gap on the lateral x-ray. The bone scan would be cold or negative because there's no activity, and this represents a non-union or a fibrous union of a stress fracture, and there's really no healing potential that's inactive, but they usually are stable, meaning there's usually no slippage. You should get a standing x-ray, you may even need to get flexion and extension views to rule out spondylolisthesis, but these are usually stable and often uh, discovered incidentally in a dancer who comes in with an episode of low back pain, and they can settle down just as any other episode of low back pain would in a couple of weeks. Not, not months. Lumbar disc herniations are uncommon in dancers as an acute uh, phenomena, but certainly degenerative disc disease occurs, and more commonly in the older dancer, probably older than 30. Um, the diagnosis is a little bit more difficult in a dancer because their straight leg raising signs are a little bit unreliable because of their flexibility. So if you're suspicious and you correlate with history and they talk about radiating pain, uh, then you need to probably uh, confirm this with an MRI scan. So here, as you can see, this dancer is doing a stretch for hamstring. She, she's not even warmed up yet. This is not as far as she can go, but 
to me, that would be a negative straight leg raise. However, if she can do this uh, 120 or 30 degrees on her good side and her injured side is 90, then that might be a straight, straight leg raise positive sign for her, so do compare to the opposite side. Always a good idea when you examine any patient, and especially dancers.